Oh, uh, I think it's it's November. I think it's November. Yeah. So, um, so the deadline to draw the class without a W was already passed, but then you can still withdraw from the class. And so, to withdraw, you have to apply for addition, and then you have to provide. Um, like documentation to show that you do uh, I mean, the petition will go to the professor eventually, but you have to fill out. Yeah, so if you fill out the petition, so if you search online, like um, like Cal State Fulton withdraw for classes, yeah. then it'll, it'll show you that it's an online thing. Yeah. yeah, so you have until I think November okay. uh, next Friday. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Um, or the maybe the Friday after that. I think like first after the first week in November, something like that. Yeah. Dr. Chen. Yeah. Do you know if they're planning to release any more technical electives? There, I know they're going to add one next week. That's uh, a new class, four thirty-six. 
So that's introduction to um, computational fluid dynamics. So that's Dr. Myrall's class. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to try to add at least one more after that. Okay. Uh, maybe two, depending on uh, depending on the demand. But yeah, there's that one, 436, one or two more after that, depending on if we can get the instru instructors working. And what about aerodynamics? Uh, oh, that I'm not sure, actually. Because yeah, usually uh, Dr. Myrall teaches that in the uh, in the spring. Mm -hmm. But I know he's teaching us 436. So, oh, so, uh, so yeah, I don't know if they're going to offer aerodynamics. And then it's the next FDA class. Is that only for graduate? You can take it. Um, and so it's uh it's it's gonna be different. And so it's gonna be focused on all the theory of FDA, right. so like writing code, but you can take it and, and count it for a technical method as well. Yeah. I'm I'm probably gonna be teaching that one too. So, okay. so we can take 500 Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be harder, but you can do it. <laughs> It's uh, four o'clock. Let's go and get uh, get started. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. How's uh, how's everyone doing today? Okay. We're good. Doing good. All right. And so uh, today we're just going to be uh, continuing on. So I think last time we, we just kind of barely um, introduced the idea of general nonlinear programming. Um, so this so this part of the class, you know, I, I think I mentioned too that this, this part of the class is really exciting. These are all uh, pretty modern methods, uh, and in fact, you know, these methods are are actually all kind of the so, uh, so your final project is, is just about ready. So I, I've kind of been working on that all uh, all this week. Uh, but I think I'll wait until Tuesday to kind of introduce it. I think it'll it'll make a little bit more sense um, at that point because uh, what I've done for the final project. So what you'll see is I'm I'm basically giving everyone two two optimization problems on the final project, and it's going to be up to you to implement the optimization algorithm. Uh, but I did do one example for you. So I did do I did implement the Monte Carlo um, method a solution to uh, to one of the problems, and so I think that'll be that'll make a, a lot more sense after we actually cover part of the problem. Okay. Um, okay. So definitely look forward to that. It's a, cool, it's a really cool project. I'm I'm really excited for it. Um, I was able to uh, you know find find some code online to kind of help me help me kind of make it really nice, uh, mostly with the visualization. So. Um, because you know a, a lot of a lot of the a lot of the problems that we're doing in class and, and you'll see a lot of the problems that we're doing now uh, they're a little bit more abstract and so for your final project I wanted to give you something that you can actually visualize and you can kind of see uh, you know your your optimization actually working and, and how and what effect it has on on the structure or on like a real problem. So um, I was able to find some code online to kind of help me with that. So uh, I'm really excited for that and hope you guys. All right, and so um, remember, homework four is due. Uh, I think it's due tomorrow night or tonight. I think tomorrow night, right? Um, and so make sure you guys are, are, are finishing up with that. Uh, I think it seems like people are kind of working through it just fine. Um, you know, answering quite a few questions this week. So, uh, but if you have any any final questions on it, you know, definitely let me know. Uh, you know, I'll be happy to answer some questions. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's about it. Are there any questions I can answer before we get started for today? Uh, oh, I brought my, I brought the exam. This will probably be the last day I'm going to bring the exams. And so if you haven't got a chance to pick it up, uh, you can pick it up after class. Uh, but after today, they're just going into storage into my office and stuff. Um, and so you know, um, if you if you didn't pick it up after today, if you're on Zoom, you need to pick it up. Just uh, just let me know and you know and, and I, I can get it to you. But today will be the last day I bring it to you. Okay. So let's uh, so let's get started. So uh, the topic for today is unconstrained. Uh, 
All right, so we, we just finished talking about uh, the Newton Raphson model, right? And so, you know, that Newton Raphson was kind of the end of what I call kind of the one dimensional um, methods, right? And so, everything that we did up, up to that point, whether it be interpolation method, uh, search methods, um, you know, Newton Raphson, those would all only work with one dimensional, um, you know, objective functions, okay? And so we started there, even though you know the a one dimensional optimization is is quite rare in reality. A lot of times, you know, uh, the kinds of problems that you want to do optimization on uh, are you know they they contain multiple variables, right? So two, three, four, five, six. Um, in your project, you're actually going to go up to, um, up to ten, I think, ten variables. Okay. And so you need more flexible and kind of um, kind of more robust methods to handle this. Okay. So that's kind of the idea with these. I did notice that there's a question in the chat. Does anybody want to finish covering this? Oh, you guys are having trouble hearing? Okay, let me see. Check to make sure. Uh, let's see. I think the microphone is, is, is this one. Uh, let's see. Let, me try, let me try a different microphone. How's this one sound? This sounds. This one sound better. Does it sound worse? Doesn't sound at all. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's better. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, let's use this one. I think I think it was trig. It was um, yeah. The microphone is probably somewhere somewhere else. But you know, I wanted to use this one here on the uh, on the computer. Okay. Good. All right. So what I was uh, what I was saying what I was saying is that you know these methods that we're going to go over work for multiple in multiple dimensions, um, but it still has all the flexibility that we were talking about before, where, you know, whenever you have a, a general nonlinear programming problem, um, you want to have a method that works without taking um, you know derivatives of the objective functions. That's kind of the whole theme with nonlinear programming in, in general. Okay, um, and so you know, in in reality, you know, there 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 will be methods where we do um, use the derivatives, and so those are called descent methods. Um, so that'll be probably one of the last things we cover in the class. But for now, you know, I want to focus on methods that you know that rely on don't that don't rely on taking the derivatives. Okay, because these are these are the ones that are honestly kind of the most practical. Okay. Okay, and so you know the the way these the set of lecture notes is 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 organized is kind of very similar to the last set of of, of lecture notes where you know we're just going to go over the algorithms kind of one at a time. Okay, and so we start. Um, oh, my God. and so we start we start with the method called the Monte Carlo method. Um, you know, um, which is uh, you know um, I think I, I think I'm, I might have mentioned this a few times in the class. The Monte Carlo method sometimes is called the random jump method. Um, is a way to kind of directly kind of search for the uh, um, for the design variables within within the space. Okay, and so the way the way Monte Carlo methods work is is the following. And so whenever you have a multiple a multi dimensional optimization problem, you know that means you're going to have multiple design variables, right?
All right, and so our, our general problem statement looks like the following. So let's say we want to minimize some function f, okay? And so this function is a, is a, it depends on the design variables, right? So remember this vector x here is a vector of our design variables, which can be, which can be any length, okay? So that depends on how many design variables we have. And so our vector x kind of looks like the following, right? And so if we number our design variables, so let's say we have x1, x2, x3, okay? And let's say we have up to n design variables, right? So that's that's kind of our that's kind of been our convention, um, you know, throughout the uh, uh, throughout the course so far, okay? okay? What we can usually say uh, in these kinds of problems is that, you know, each of these design variables is going to be bound by what's called the, uh, an upper bound and a lower bound. And this goes for every design variable. So, oops, uh, we're lagging a bit. Um, and so, you know, for a case when you have both, when you have up to n design variables, this means that your ranges can also uh, can also be different for each design variable, right? So, variable x1 is going to have its own range, maybe from you know x1 lower to x1 upper. Same thing for x2. Okay, but usually we know kind of uh, the range that we um, can be uh, that these design variables are constrained. With, okay. Right, come on, internet. There we go. Like magic, it's, it's writing as if it were like, you know, 30 seconds in the past. This is trippy. I'm seeing my I'm seeing my bad handwriting in real time right in front of me. Okay. Protective range. Good. Okay, so let's say that we have uh, you know our variable x1 here. So 30 seconds in the past. All right. So x1 will be bound by, you know, x1 lower and x1 upper, okay? Same thing for x2, so x2 will be bound okay? between x2 low and x2 upper, okay? And we can continue this, right? And so every design variable usually has its own respective range, right? And this isn't too different from what's 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 what happens in reality, right? So oftentimes when you're running these optimization problems, these design variables often represent, you know, some kind of property or some kind of physical dimension of your, um, you know, of your geometry, okay? And so a lot of times those uh, those those variables are just kind of naturally bound by um, by some limiting factor, right? Um, and so this is usually not hard to, to get. Okay? All right. And so one way that we can interpret this is that you know um, if we're kind of bound by these ranges, our optimal design point is going to lie. Our optimal our optimal value for each design variable is going to lie somewhere within that range. So that last statement is, isn't isn't really that groundbreaking, right? And so you know um, we have an optimization problem. Our design variables are bound by ranges, and so you know obviously we're going to be looking within that range for their optimal value. Okay. 
And so the way Monte Carlo method methods work is that you know they say, all right, you know, we we know we know where our design variables are bound by, right? We know it has to be somewhere within that range. What if we just kind of just randomly search within that range? So we just kind of assign random numbers within that range. Okay. So normally, you know, if, if you were to do this by hand, right, this 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 is this would not be a productive method at all, right? Because you would guess something, you do the calculations, you check it, and then you'd make another guess. And so you you'd literally be firing just you know in the dark, hoping to find an optimal solution. Okay. The the only reason Monte Carlo methods work is because you know, oftentimes you're going to be implementing this in a computer. And a computer is able to generate is is one able to generate random numbers very easily. Uh, and two, it's able to kind of generate a lot of these guesses and run the simulation and uh, evaluate the objective function with great, great speed. And then from there, the logic of the logic of a large number tends to take over. So that you know, if if you make enough random guesses, right, eventually you're going to reach one that's that's fairly optimal, at least has some kind of optimal value. Okay. All right, so let me let me give you kind of an an analogy of, of kind of what this looks like, right? And so a lot of these a lot of these algorithms I think are easily visualized in two D. Um, although you know they they can off they can also be kind of um, um, extended to multiple um, to dimensions higher than two D as well. Okay, so I've drawn here I've drawn a rectangle for you here. Okay, and imagine this rectangle is kind of our our design space, right? And so our horizontal axis, you know, maybe that's going to be our first design variable x1, and then our vertical axis will be our second design variable x2. And so, you know, in this case, we're just going to have a two-dimensional optimization plot, right? Okay. So the optimal value or the optimal design point is going to be somewhere within this rectangle, right? Um, and so, in, in fact, actually, you can consider this rectangle, right, the size of the rectangle to be the bounds, right? So this will be x1, low, x2, x1, upper, okay? And then same thing, x2, low, and the upper will be x2, upper, okay? Right. So we know our, 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 our optimal design point is somewhere within this rectangle, right? The way Monte Carlo methods work is that, you know, you're going to take, you're going to take a, um, I don't know, a dart, right? And you're just going to just blind, just close your eyes and just throw it at this rectangle. So this right here is our first random guess. Okay. I'll call it random guess one. Okay. All right. So once we have our first random guess, we can evaluate the objective function there. And so evaluating the objective function is, is kind of like saying, you know, are we close to the treasure? Are we are we at the treasure? Okay. 
right? And so then we we kind of note that. And so we kind of note, you know, just how good that guess is based on the value of the objective function, okay? Then we can take another guess. And another guess, 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 okay? okay. You're gonna just gonna keep taking guesses at, at different locations, right? And at each location, you're gonna check and see, you know, is this guess better than our previous best guess? And so even though even though we're taking random guesses, you know, we we still have to keep track in terms of, you know, what what is our current best guess, right? And then each time we make a new one, you know, we 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 replace that best guess if we see an improvement, okay? If not, then we just take another guess, right? And we just keep doing this over and over and over again, right? We just keep taking more guesses, right? Eventually you have, you have to put a stop to this. So eventually you have to stop and, and say like, all right, that's 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 enough, okay? So after you take that fixed amount of guesses, then you then you kind of pull back and say, all right, well, among all the you know one million guesses that I just took, you know which one was the best value, and then that's going to be your optimum. Okay. All right, and so if you recall, you know, the, I think when I first introduced Monte Carlo to, to you, this is what I, I call, I kind of call this the dumbest method that works really, really well. And so it, it literally is just taking a, a bunch of random guesses and it's, uh, you know, and, and kind of the terminology that we that we typically use for is, is that this is kind of a brute force, uh, a brute force solution, right? And so just by just by sheer brute force of, of the power of, 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 uh, of modern computers, uh, you know, you can arrive at, a, at an optimal solution to this problem. Okay, you can arrive at a solution to this at, a, at an optimization problem that you know mathematicians a hundred years ago would would uh, uh, take days to to do. Right, but now now it's kind of an afterthought with uh, with computers and 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 Monte Carlo. Okay, so that's the idea. And so uh, and so uh, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the implementation details. Um, we're going to make use of random numbers in MATLAB for the first time, and so I want to I want to do a little bit of tutorial on that, and then I'll run through the actual code example that I have posted on online. Okay. Um, all right. Before we do that, are there are there any questions about just how Monte Carlo methods work? Okay. All right. So let's talk about some implementation details. Okay. And so to get this to work. Uh, we need to be able to generate random numbers in in code. Okay. And so every every coding language kind of has its own unique way of generating random numbers. Um, 
And but in MATLAB, we use a function called ramp. And so when you type RAND, so RAND is kind of a special uh, a special word in, in MATLAB, okay? Let me not put quotes, because in, in code, you don't have to put quotes, okay? And so when you call RAND, okay, you can almost treat it like, like, a, like a variable, okay? Um, it's a variable that you can't overwrite, but it's uh, because it's, it's kind of a special function within MATLAB. Okay? And so when you call RAND, what MATLAB is going to do is that it's going to generate um, a uniform random number, or a, a random number from a uniform distribution. Okay? okay. And what that means basically, at, at least at least for for what you have to kind of worry about is that when you call RAND, it's going to generate a random number between zero and one. Okay, and you know decimals are, are obviously are are a matter. So it's some random decimal between zero and one. Okay. Okay. So we can use this, right? Um, but you know uh, the question then becomes, you know, how do we use a, a random number like this? Because if we're limited to between zero and one, you know, a lot of our design variables for the most part are not going to be between zero and one. So how do we use RAND to, to generate a, a random number within a range? Because what we just finished talking about was that in Monte Carlo, you know, each of our design variables has its own lower bound and upper bound. Right? So, for example, right, let's say that for a particular design variable uh, x1, let's say that its value is somewhere between 10 and 15. So x1 low is equal to 10, and x1 upper is equal to 15. So in other words, the value for x1 is going to be between 10 and 15, okay? All right, we want to be able to generate a random number within that range, within between 10 and 15, okay? And so the code's going to look something like, like this. And, and then I'll show you the actual MATLAB code in a second. So let's let's say that we want to generate a guess for x1. Okay. So the code the code is like the following. So we say x x1 guess is equal to x1 low, okay, plus the difference between x1 upper minus x1 low, okay, multiplied by ram. All right, so the only the only place where the randomness comes into play is that second term there. Right? Okay. All right, so how does this work? Okay. And so let's I'm gonna go from the right to the left actually. So oops. okay. And so if you look at the part that I've highlighted in red right there, you know, we have the difference between x upper and x low. And then what we're multiplying this by is some random number between zero and one. Okay. So that means that term there is going to be anything between, um, you know, um, zero and uh, x upper minus x low. Okay. okay. And so let's look at these two extremes. And so, you know, the x1 low, the first term, that's going to be the same. Okay. So let me go ahead and bring this guy down. So we have x1 low. Okay. And then let me give you kind of the, the true extremes here. So, you know, the first case here is going to be when rand is equal to zero. Okay. And so we're, when rand is equal to zero, 
that whole term there is going to be zero because we, we just we multiply by zero. Okay. The other extreme there is when rand is going to be equal to one. So when rand is equal to one, that entire second term there is going to be x1 upper minus x1 low. Okay. All right, and so if we add these through, and so for the first case when rand is equal to zero, our guess, our guess for x1 is going to be x1 low, okay? And then on the other side of the coin, if, if rand is equal to one, we have x1 low plus x1 upper minus x1 low. The two x1 lows are going to cancel out. And so we end up with x1 upper, okay? But remember, you know, that rand is, is not going to be zero or one. It's going to be some random number in between zero and one, right? And so it, it's, you know, whatever we guess for X1 is going to be somewhere between these two, right? But these, but this is kind of the lower bound and the upper bound for whatever our code is going to generate for, for X1, okay? All right. So this is perfect, right? So this is exactly what we want. And so we want, you know, when, when we run our code, you know, we want our guess for X1 to be somewhere between X1 low and X1 upper, okay? And so you can use this, uh, you can use this syntax here, okay? Or you can use this kind of technique here, which utilizes the MATLAB RAND number uh, to generate a number that's between, you know, its lower bound and its upper bound, okay? All right, and so you're going to see this repeated for every single random number that we're, uh, every single kind of guess that we're going to generate with Monte Carlo. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this before we, we jump into the example? Yeah. Rand I, that's rand, random integer. You good. Yeah, and so that that and so ran i basically does this 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 too, and so there's there's lots of different ways to generate random numbers, but uh, but this this is kind of just generally kind of how I do it. But um, yeah, I think the ran package has other functions that you can use too. So, yeah, randomness is actually very interesting because because you know when you're asking a computer is not a random object. Yeah. Actually, it's actually but that's that's a that's a whole another discussion <laughs> for another day. Um, and so when you, you, I think there's other random functions that let you draw from different distributions too. And so I think rand and rand i both draw from the uniform distribution. So, um, and so yeah, rand i is another, another option. Yeah. Okay. okay. So let's, uh, so let's look at the, uh, let's look at the example. So I'm going to write, I'm going to write out the objective function here. Um, and then we're going to look at the code, uh, afterwards. Okay. So for this example here, I have a two-dimensional uh, optimization problem. So let's say you want to minimize. Okay. Let's say we want to minimize the following functions. We have f of x1, x2 is equal to x1 minus x2 plus 2x1 squared plus 2x1, x2, plus x2 squared, okay? Where we're going to say both uh, both variables are constrained by the following ranges. So we'll say x1 is constrained between the range of minus 2 to positive 2, okay? And we're going to use the same uh, range for the other um, variable as well. So minus 2, 2, okay? Okay, 
And so we want to find the optimum of this function using uh, Monte Carlo. All right, and so and so for the first time in this class, you know, we have an example that we actually cannot uh, work out by hand, right? Unless you're really good at, at generating random numbers, and you can do this, you know, hundreds of thousands of times uh, without getting tired, then then you know, I think the easier way is to write uh, write a code for this. Okay. Okay. So the code. Um, let me give you the name of the code. Right, so this so this example code is going to be on the can. It's already on the Canvas site, and so if you look under the folder for example codes, um, the name of the file is UNLP example one Monte Carlo. Dot M. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and switch to the computer screen here. With the mouse that goes at a bajillion miles an hour. Okay. So I think this is not it. Let me pull up on the call. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this is how the this is how the code looks like, right? So I just I just pulled this from the from the website. Actually, I think I downloaded it before. Let me get that one. Um, there it is. Okay. So this is the uh, Monte Carlo code that we have, right? Okay, so let's look, let's look at it from the top. And so you can see here that I've defined a number n. So this big n here defines the number of times that we're going to uh, that that we're going to do. Okay, and so in other words, this is the number of guesses that we'll take. Okay. Uh, we have an initial guess in this case. Oh, so this this is optional for Monte Carlo. You actually don't need an initial guess. Uh, but the uh, but a lot of the but all the other algorithms actually do depend on an initial guess. So um, and so you know uh, because we know that the um, our two design variables here are constrained between negative two and two, and so let's just take a guess that's you know right in the middle of that domain x one and x two um, equals to zero, and then we evaluate our objective function there. Okay. Okay. So you can see here that we've also defined variables that define the upper and lower bounds for the design variables, right? So x1 low is equal to minus 2, x1 up is equal to positive 2, same thing for 2, okay? Um, and then another thing that we're doing here is we're keeping track of the current optimum, okay? Remember that, you know, it's Monte Carlo is more than just taking a bunch of random guesses. You have to keep track of, you know, what your best guess is at the time, okay? Um, and in our particular case, you know, since we are running a minimization problem, you know, our best guess is going to be the one that has the, the, the most negative or, or lowest value um, of the objective function, okay? And so, so far, we've only taken one guess, and so we've only taken our, uh, our initial guess here, and so we're going to assume that that's going to be our best guess for, for now, okay? Okay, and then from there, we enter our iteration, right? And so, first thing we're going to do, we're going to generate a random variable, and so you can see here, I have R1 and R2. Both of them are generating a random variable, okay? So even though both of these are calling the rand function, you know, each time rand is called, it actually generates a different random variable. So R1 and R2 are actually going to be different values here, uh, even though they both call rand. Okay. Okay. From there, we compute the uh, the trial value. So this is our guess for x1, x2, and you can see here that I'm using the formula that I uh, that I just covered in the notes. We have the lower bound plus the random number times the difference between the upper and the lower bound. Okay. We do that twice. Um, after we take our guess for x1 and x2, we're then going to compute the objective function at this point. Okay, and so you can see here we have our objective function here, okay, where instead of using x1, x2, the initial ones, we're using our guess here, right? So x1 trial minus x2 trial plus two times x1 trial squared plus two times x1 trial times x2 trial plus x2 trial squared. Okay. All right, and then from there, we're gonna check and see if our design point is more optimal, right? And so if our trial, uh, our trial, um, you know, um, our trial objective function, which is the objective function for a guess, if that is less than our current best one, right? And so if we found if we found a design point just by pure randomness that's better than our current best one, then we save it, okay? 
And so then we, what we say is that our current guess, best guess for X1 is equal to our current trial, our X2 best guess is equal to X2 trial, and then our F best is equal to F trial. Okay? Okay, and that's it. It's, it's a very simple, just 41 line code, right? And, and a lot of this is actually kind of superfluous too, just because I've, I've added extra variables here just to make it a bit more clear, okay? And so if we run this code, right? This code is gonna run, how many is this? I think it's 500,000, right? And so let's take 500,000 guesses. And it's probably gonna be done by the time I navigate here. Yep, you can see it's done. And so you can see here from our, uh, um, from our window here in the bottom left that our that the best guess for X1 is going to be minus one, and our best guess for X2 is going to be 1.5, okay? All right, and so by pure, uh, you, you know, by pure randomness, you know, using Monte Carlo, we were able to find the optimal solution to this, uh, to this problem, okay? All right, and so, you know, hopefully, you know, um, you know, hopefully you can uh, uh, follow that code. So, uh, so Monte Carlo is great. And so it's uh, for cases like this, you know, this is actually the perfect kind of problem that Monte Carlo would work well with because, you know, the objective function here is just, is just a mathematical equation. So this is very, very cheap to, uh, to evaluate. In fact, let me, uh, um, oops, it's the wrong code. Random. This is random walk. We're going to go that one second. Okay. And so you can see here from the objective function that this, this right here is, is very, very cheap to compute. Okay. And so for functions that are very, very cheap to compute like this, you know, Monte Carlo works, works great. It works fantastic. Okay. Because then for, uh, you know, for something that's cheap to compute, you can just generate, you know, um, thousands, millions, even billions of guesses if you want. Um, and it's going to be done just kind of in a blink of an eye. Okay. And then just by, you know, just by pure law of large numbers, right? If you take a billion guesses, you know, one of them is going to be bound to be the best. Okay. And that's essentially how Monte Carlo works. Okay. Um, any questions on, uh, on this code here? Okay. All right, so that's Monte Carlo, uh, and so you know Monte Carlo is is great. Uh, so technically, it's uh, technically Monte Carlo is going to work for your final project as well. Uh, but I am I am disallowing you from using Monte Carlo for the final project just because you know that would be a little bit that would be a little bit too easy for uh, for the final project. Okay. All right, and so that's so that's our first algorithm, and so that's uh, so that's exciting, right? And so now, you know, um, technically speaking, you can uh, you can use Monte Carlo for for almost any optimization problem, okay? But Monte Carlo has 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 a problem, right? And so even though Monte Carlo, you know, it seems like a very nice method, right? It does have some drawbacks. In the chat. Question. Um, if we use a larger number of iterations, will we get a different answer? Or do we land on the same answer each time? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the idea with Monte Carlo, because you know, because of the way that we're we're keeping track of what our current best point is, the idea is that you know, if if you use a large enough number of iterations, you're gonna land on the same answer every time. Maybe not exactly the same answer up to the up, you know, the seventh decimal point. But you know, up to a few decimal points, it's going to be the same one because that's that's where the true optimum is. Um, and so, if you reduce the number of iterations, so you know, let's say that you only take, um, you know, let's say you only take a hundred guesses, right? If you only take a hundred guesses, it's less likely that you're going to find that most optimal point. Um, and so, Monte Carlo actually, you know, in order to make it work, you need to actually run it for larger, larger numbers of iterations, uh, which is also one of its downsides. So, actually, that's kind of a good segue into what I'm. Um, you know, going to talk about here. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, so Monte Carlo works great, but but you know, um, the what the way that people talk about it is that you know Monte Carlo, even though eventually you know if you run enough iterations, you'll 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 find the optimal point. Um, a lot of times, it's it's very slow to get there, and in fact, it's 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 actually random. You know how quickly you can find that optimal point.
And so in this case, you know, when, when we're talking about optimization algorithms, you know, the, the, the fastness of the, of, the, uh, of the optimization depends on the number of iterations that you need. Uh, or in other words, another way you can think about it, the number of objective function evaluations, okay? And so when I say that, you know, that the Monte Carlo method is slow, what I mean is that it requires many, many, many function evaluations to, to get it to work. And so you can see from the last uh, from the last code we set the number of iterations to five hundred thousand, um, and so that's that's not an insignificant number, okay? Because you know, uh, and this kind of alludes to the you know what I was saying earlier um, about the objective function being cheap, okay? If it is if it is expensive to evaluate your objective function. Even if the objective function only takes, you know, maybe five seconds to to compute, right? Five seconds doesn't sound like a long time, but if you take five seconds and you multiply it by five hundred thousand iterations, right? Five seconds times the five hundred thousand, um, that is uh, that is a lot of seconds. And so, um, so that's like two point five million seconds, right? So that's that's you know, I can't even compute how many days that is, right? So if your uh, objective function is expensive, Monte Carlo just just doesn't become practical because you're not you're not going to be able to generate all the evaluations that's needed to find the optimal solution. Okay. And a lot of times, you know, you're going to have situations where your objective function is, uh, you know, decently expensive to uh, to evaluate. Right? And so, for the final project that I'm giving you, the uh, the objective function isn't isn't that expensive to evaluate, but it does take a couple seconds. And so, if you have it, if you have an algorithm that's going to take, you know, 100,000, 200,000 evaluations, you know, you're going to be sitting at your computer for a very, very long time waiting for for it to finish. Um, and that's you know, and that's 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 just not practical. Okay. In fact, you know, uh, for this reason, every other um, optimization algorithm, you know. What its goal is is that it it needs to do better than Monte Carlo. Okay, so Monte Carlo is kind of the baseline. So that's kind of the the, the most basic optimization algorithm that you can do, at least in a nonlinear context, right? If you're designing your own optimization algorithm, you just have you have to do better than Monte Carlo. Okay? And in fact, all of the other algorithms that we'll talk about in, in this class do do better than Monte Carlo. Okay. And so before we move on to the next uh, uh, to the next algorithm, you know, let's let me let me give you kind of a metric that we can use to uh, to quantify how well a uh, how well an optimization algorithm uh, performs. So let's consider its, its rate of convergence, right? And so, you know, the way, kind of the terminology that's used in the optimization world is that, you know, as you iterate more and more, right, as, you, as your algorithm goes, 
eventually you're going to converge on the optimal solution, okay? And so the rate of convergence is how quickly your algorithm can converge on that solution. Okay, okay. and so the rate of convergence is defined like the following. So we have this uh, relationship here, okay? It's, it's not all that different from, uh, um, you know, the way we rated convergence in the 1D case. Okay. And so we're going to take this ratio here. So Xi, let me go ahead and label these for you. So Xi is our current guess, our current design point in the, uh, in the iteration. Xi plus one here is our the next design point in the in the algorithm. Okay, so this is the um, the next the next the uh, the design point in the next iteration. Okay, and then X star here, the star should be in the uh, star should be in the bottom. So X star here, this is our optimal design point, okay? Okay. okay. So this is so this defines our rate of convergence. Okay, and so what we're saying is that you know basically what this what this uh, expression here tells you is that as you iterate more and more, right, your x i plus one should get you closer to the optimal than your previous guess. Okay, and so this right here has to be less than some threshold um, epsilon. Okay, so epsilon here is the convergence threshold. But the uh, um, kind of the uh, the uh, the point or the kind of the most important point here is actually this variable here that kind of snuck in, um, you know, while I was talking, is this p. Okay. So this p you can see is is the exponent of the denominator. So this p right here is defined as our rate of convergence. And so the higher that number p the more quickly our algorithm is going to converge. And so better designed algorithms or more powerful algorithms are going to have p values of like, you know, two or three. Um, it's, it's, it's really hard. To, it's actually really hard to get past two. And so, um, you know, in, in the best case, you know, p, a p value of two, we call that quadratically convergent. Uh, and that's kind of the best you can do. And so Monte Carlo is somewhere, somewhere less than one, actually. It's, I think it's like one half or something like that. So, it, so Monte Carlo is, is, is actually very, very slow convergence. And so, you know, all the algorithms that we're going to go uh, uh, talk about from, from here on is going to have better convergence than, than Monte Carlo. Okay. But that's generally how we, that's generally how we rate this. And, that, and that's generally how we talk about kind of the performance of an algorithm is, you know, how quickly or how, how well can it converge on the optimal solution. Okay. okay. Any questions on, on this so far? All right, and so uh, so we've done Monte Carlo. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one, right? And so Monte Carlo is called, you know, sometimes we call it the random jumping one because we literally kind of just jump around randomly in the uh, uh, in the domain, right? The next algorithm that we're going to go over is something called the random walk. Okay. We went from random jumping to random walk. Right. So unfortunately, random walk doesn't have a cool name like Monte Carlo. You know, I guess you can call it the drunken walk um, algorithm if you want. Um, but I, but you know, 
kind of funnily enough, you know, walking around drunk and just walking randomly is actually better than just ra just total random guessing. And, and we'll kind of talk about what. Okay. Okay. So what is uh what is the random walk method? So random walk, um, you know, it random walk tries to fix kind of one one kind of big weakness of the Monte Carlo method. And so in the Monte Carlo method, you know, um, let's say that we, we make our random jump and we find a point that's like pretty good, okay? And so in Monte Carlo, we made jump. And so Monte Carlo, you know, we may jump to a point which, you know, which we find like, oh yeah, this this point's pretty good. So this is our current best point. Okay. And so, you know, the way the way a lot of objective functions are 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 uh, are, are are kind of made, right? Um, usually, if you find a point that's pretty good, you know, even better points are going to be within that same neighborhood, right? And so it's 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 not going to be the point. It's not really going to be the um, um, you know, you're not really going to observe a point where like you jump to a random point. And you jump to another random point that's completely far away, and that point's going to be better. Okay. And so in this case, you know, an even better point is usually within that same neighborhood. Think about think about you know our, our treasure hunting analogy, right? And so let's say that you know you're you're on you're walking on the beach, you know you have your metal detector, you're looking for treasures, right? You find you find a point where the metal detector is kind of going off, right? You dig in that spot, you don't find the treasure, right? But you know in, intuitively, kind of what you're thinking is that the treasure should be nearby, okay? The problem with Monte Carlo is that you know there's there's no way to kind of make use of that information. So we jump to a place. You would find something that's pretty good, and then immediately we jump far away, right? Okay. So we don't want that, right? So we, we want to we want to stay in that neighborhood. We want to stay close to that point because that's that's kind of where we think the optimum is going to be. Okay. Right, and so that and so that's what random walk kind of helps alleviate. And so in random walk, you know, we're 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 going to search, you know, our next the next guess that we're going to make for our uh, um, for our objective function is going to be within the same neighborhood of our previous point. Yeah. Would it make sense that only like two thirds one random? It would. Yes. So that's a that's a great point. And so um, if you have a case with multiple minimums, then you could get stuck. And so if you so let's say that you know you're, you're you find a good uh, value of the objective function. And you walk near there, and you find the local minimum, but that may not be the the the, uh, the, the true minimum. So that may be somewhere else. Um, so that's true. So that that is a weakness of, of this method. So um, and so kind of what you'll find is that you know different algorithms will work in kind of different scenarios. So for an objective function with kind of one minimum, this is going to perform better than Monte Carlo because we're going to kind of localize the search to where it's good. Uh, but when you have kind of multiple valleys or multiple kind of optimum. You know, Monte Carlo is actually be better than because then you actually jump to a different place and then you kind of can get out of this this rut. Um, so yeah, that's that's definitely a great observation. Yep. Okay. And so in random walk, and random walk, our next guess is just going to be one step away from our current guess.
All right, so it looks like this. So let's say we have xi plus one, okay? So xi plus one is gonna be our next guess, right? xi here is our current guess, okay? And so to get our next guess, we're gonna start at our current guess and just take one step. And so we have a lambda plus u j, u i. Let me go ahead and label all of these. So xi plus one, this is our next guess. This xi is our current guess. Ui is our step direction. And this lambda here is our step limit. All right, so this seems pretty straightforward, right? Um, the reason we call it random walk is that this, this direction here, right? This direction is gonna be a vector that's the same size as, as our design variables, okay? Um, but we're gonna generate this using random numbers. So just like Monte Carlo, we're going to make use of RAND, um, and and you know feel free to use any RAND function that you feel most comfortable with. Um, but we're going to use RAND to kind of generate that that direction. Okay, so that's so that's kind of the general idea. So let me let me write out the uh, the algorithm in words here, um, and then you know we'll go we'll look at the code. Okay, so I'm going to write down kind of the algorithm for for random walk, and so you're you're going to see this is going to be kind of more common for uh, for all the other algorithms. Monte Carlo was kind of a was kind of an outlier because it's you know it's literally just doing random stuff, uh, but for most algorithms, there's going to be kind of a step by step process that you can follow here, and you can implement these. Uh, I've written them in a way where you can implement each step kind of almost directly in code. Okay. Okay. And so step one, step one is uh, we need to start with an initial guess. Okay, so we'll call that X naught vector. We also need to start with a, a starting step length. We'll call that lambda lambda naught. Okay. The step length is something that we're going to adjust as we go through the algorithm, as 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 I'll uh, as I'll mention a bit. Okay. Next thing we have to define is something called a minimum allowable step length. Okay. So what you're going to see during the algorithm is that you know we're, we're going to start our random walk by taking big steps, right? Because you know we're probably going to start somewhere far away from the optimum, and we want to make sure we take big steps in order to in order to get there. Okay. And then as we get closer and closer and closer to the optimum, you know we want to take smaller and smaller steps because you know we want to keep kind of searching in that neighborhood. So our step size is eventually going to go down as we go through the algorithm, but we have to set a minimum because after we kind of uh, get lower than that minimum, we want to stop. Okay. And then the last thing we're we're going to define is a is a variable called n, and that's going to be the maximum number of iterations per cycle. Okay. All 
All right, and so what that what that basically means is that you know, um, like I just mentioned, in, in each cycle, you know, we're going to be taking steps of a certain length. Okay, after we take a certain amount of steps, and so you know, let's say we take ten steps with with a certain step length, then we're going to move on to the next cycle where we reduce the step length. Okay, so that n that n is kind of an upper bound, uh, just to make sure that you know we we eventually kind of stop this this alpha. Okay. okay. So step one here is just defining all the variables and all the uh, um, all all the kind of the bookkeeping that we need. Okay. Step two. Step two is to is to evaluate the objective function at the initial point. We'll call that F naught, right? Because we have to have some frame of reference, right? Because we want to make sure that after we take our steps, that we're that we should we ideally should be improving the objective function, okay? Okay, and so after after we have our initial point and our initial objective function, then we need to start step, okay? And so and so step three here is uh, kind of the, the start of our random walk. Okay? So step three is to generate a random direction using uh, random number generator. Okay, so the formula for it is like the following. So, you know, we, we're using the uh, the symbol UI here to denote the directions, okay? And then uh, each, you know, and we're going to assume that this direction here has the same dimensions or the same number of, uh, of, of entries as our design variables, okay? So this is going to be R1, R2, dot, 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 Rn, okay? Where each of those Rs is a random number between minus 1 and 1, okay? And then to normalize this, just to make sure that our, our, our step length, our step direction here has a, a magnitude of one, we're going to divide by its magnitude. Okay. So we're going to divide this by R1 squared plus or square root of R1 squared plus R2 squared plus dot, 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 plus Rn squared. Okay. Because since we're multiplying our step direction by our step length afterwards, you know, we want to make sure that our direction is a unit, is a unit there. Okay. So that's why we kind of divide by its, its, uh, its magnitude. Okay. One other thing that we have to do at this point, um, and so this is this is kind of a uh, um, kind of a math a math thing, is that you know when when you're generating random numbers like this and random directions, it's very possible that your directions are going to be biased in a certain in a, in a certain direction. Okay. And this and this is just kind of just due to how random numbers work in, in computers. And so you know I I don't want to get too much into it just because it's 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 kind of a a very lengthy and kind of a um, kind of somewhat boring conversation. But we want to make sure that our directions are not biased. Okay. And the way a direction can get biased is if you uh, basically if you generate numbers that are you know closer to the, the bounds, right? And so we we want to make sure that you know not that many of our R's are, are closer to minus one point. Okay. And so we're going to check and see. So we have to check and see if if the magnitude of our vector, so r1 squared plus r2 squared plus dot 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 plus rn squared, okay? If that magnitude is greater than 1, 
then we reject this direction and find a new one. Because if we if we kind of keep repeating that, and so if we keep finding if we keep finding directions where the overall magnitude is greater than one, um, then we're going to be kind of we're going to be biased towards the corners. That's that's kind of what this this means. And so we're going to reject that direction and just and just generate a, a new. Okay. All right. So it sounds complicated, but you'll when you'll see in the code, it's 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 not going to be that that bad. Yeah, because if we don't do that, then you know eventually we're going to keep taking steps and we're going to end up at the at the extremities of the domain. And we don't want that. We want to make sure that you know whenever we're taking steps, we're kind of checking each direction kind of. Okay. Okay. And so once we determine our direction, we're going to compute our new design point as. And so for now, I'm going to call it XT. Okay, so it's just it's just going to be a trial point. So XT is going to be XI plus lambda UI, where UI was the, uh, the direction that we just found. So we're going to compute that and the corresponding objective function at that point. We'll call that FT. Okay. All right. And so in step four, the way that you can think of it is like we're kind of taking a test step, right? So we're stepping in that direction and we're seeing if it needs to an improvement. Okay. And so in step five here, you know, we, we're only going to accept this new point if it leads to an improvement of the objective function. If it doesn't, then we just reject it. And so we we check we kind of check a different direction from our current point. Okay. And so we're going to repeat this, okay? And so steps three through five, three, four, and five kind of constitute the main kind of body of the random walkout. And so from our current point, we're going to find a random direction. We're going to step in that direction. If it leads to an improvement, then that's good. If not, then we take we go back to our current point and we check a different direction. Okay. So step six, step six is just to repeat. Repeat steps three through five. Okay. Until. Uh, the number of iterations reaches n. Because okay. we have to stop this at, at some point, right? And so, because because we're using randomness, you know, there's there's no real way to know, you know, uh, until that, you know, maybe we're reaching kind of the end here, okay? And so we have to kind of put a hard stop on this. So that's why we kind of define n there. So it tells us how many times we repeat steps three through five. Okay. okay. And so after you've taken a, a certain amount of steps, you know, with a certain step length, you know, step seven here is to reduce the step size uh, by a certain amount.
And so you can choose any factor that you want to reduce the step size by, but uh, the code that I have is, is fairly aggressive. And so we're going to reduce the step size by half. Okay. And so uh, remember, remember what I mentioned before is that, you know, generally the idea is that as, as you take more steps and as you accept more points, you're going to get closer and closer and closer to the optimal point. Okay. Right? Um, and so as you get closer to the optimum, you know, you want to kind of reduce the size of your steps, you know, to make sure that you can kind of make those baby steps kind of towards the optimum because, you know, as you get warmer and warmer, if your steps are too big, you might just kind of miss the optimum entirely. Right? So you want to make sure you reduce your step size in this case. Okay. So you're going to reduce your step size, then go back to step three. Okay. And so you're just going to repeat steps three through six again, you know, just with a smaller step size. Okay. And you're just going to, you're going to repeat this. Okay. Okay, you're going to repeat steps three through seven until step size gets lower than epsilon. Okay. So epsilon is kind of the smallest step size. And so once you kind of reach that threshold of our step size being so, so small, then we terminate the algorithm and just wherever we are at the current location, that's going to be our optimal. Okay. It's, it's literally, I guess, I guess we can call it the drunken walk algorithm because it's, it's, you know, you're basically walking around in kind of random, uh, random directions until, um, until you reach the optimum. Okay. All right. Um, so I do, have, I do have an example code for this, but we are out of time, and so I think we are, we'll cover that on, uh, on Tuesday. Um, any final questions on this before we wrap it up for the week? Okay. All right. So that's all we got time for today. Um, if you're here in class and you haven't picked up your exam, I, I have them here. You can come pick it up. Um, if not, uh, thank you guys for coming today. Um, and I hope you guys have a good weekend. And I will see you next week. Uh, you can just uh, uh, um, attach the code to the home. So just turn it to a PDF and then submit it. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's exactly what I want. So so you're gonna. And so I want you guys to start getting practice doing that because that's that's what we're gonna use for for this stuff here. So I have an example code for basically every algorithm that we're writing. And so, you know, I've, I've done kind of most of that night work for you. And so I want you guys to get a practice of, you know, you know, taking a different objective function, taking different constraints and applying it to that. So yeah, you can just, you can just literally copy the same file and then you can only change the objective. And for the answer, can we put in a picture of the graph? No, no, just, uh, so just give me just the, just the code and tell me what the optimum point is. Okay, okay. Yeah. no graph. Uh, no graph. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.